Hey everybody, good evening. This is Dr. Sullivan back with you for another live I Care For Your Brain. We are gonna be talking tonight about psychological triggers. I was thinking over the last week what I wanted the topic to be. And you know, sometimes we go a little bit more brain, sometimes we go a little bit more psychology. Um, and this one is coming right down the middle because there are things that happen in our central nervous system that are triggered by trauma and stress and uh, unexpected loss and all sorts of things that unfortunately as human beings we go through all too often as we live this human life. Um, but the last week has been particularly hard for many of us with the Supreme Court hearings and I definitely do not want to get political but I think for many of my patients and many of my friends and myself included as well there were plenty of things to be triggered about. If you have suffered with the themes of uh, being silenced, being accused, being bullied, you might have found yourself having very strong physical reactions this week. And I just thought, you know, that's a really good reminder that um, these feelings are very uncomfortable. And the thing that we typically do to cope is the very worst thing we could do, and that is to avoid the triggers. So I wanted to spend some time with you tonight talking about what exactly are these triggers. But as you know, what I always care about is how can I help you understand how to maybe think about things differently, how to do things differently in a way that is more psychologically healthy. So what is a trigger? It's kind of almost a little bit of a popular science term. It gets kind of thrown around, but really it has a very specific physiological signature that happens in the nervous system. And we define it as any kind of a stimulus. So this can be a smell, a sound, a sight, can be internal, can be something that you see or experience externally, can be conscious, can be unconscious, but that reminds you of a previous trauma. Typically, it elicits feelings of severe anxiety and what we call protective behavior. So people either get into the fight, flight, or freeze mode. So sometimes people get very angry when they've been triggered. Some people get very numb, very kind of protective so they can't feel or experience pain. Some people get um, very immobile and they can't really process, they kind of shut down. It's really different for everyone. But after a trigger happens, there is a huge dump of stress hormones, adrenaline, cortisol, that basically shoot throughout the body and give us the physical feelings of racing heart, muscle tension, feeling like we're sweating, feeling like we're trapped. The stimulus itself doesn't necessarily have to be frightening or traumatic. It's just that in some way it directly or indirectly reminds us of a very specific time in the past. These triggers can be subtle, they can be difficult to interpret. You might not even know you have been triggered because typically it's tipping off something that we've suppressed and pushed down so much that it is outside of our conscious awareness. And that can be very, very confusing. So typical triggers are things like anniversaries, dates, right? Those are fairly obvious. But uh, many people have triggers that surround the way things look, specifically light during different times of the year. So I've known some people that unfortunately were in the September 11th attacks and anytime it turns into fall and there's that certain crisp smell in the air, um, the way the light changes a little bit in the autumn time can be very triggering for people because it was something that happened that morning that happened that day that the brain has kind of latched onto as kind of a warning sign. One of the most painful parts about trauma is when it is unexpected. There is some really good data that talks about car accidents and people who are hit head on are actually on the whole less psychologically traumatized than when people are hit from behind. And the, you might think it's the opposite, right? So if you see it coming, you might feel like, God, that would be much more traumatic because I would see it and I would experience it. 
Well, the idea is that even in a split second, you can psychologically prepare for something that you see directly happening. The most traumatic things are things that we did not see coming. And what the brain does, what the psyche does as a way of coping, is to tell us all sorts of lies and distortions about the woulda, coulda, shouldas, right? So if only I wouldn't have done that that morning, if only I would have taken a left instead of a right, you know, if only I didn't wear that outfit that night, if only I wouldn't have had that drink. And really that puts us back in control because what is so intolerable to us as human beings is the idea that something was completely out of control. Because how do you go on living if your safety bubble, your illusion that things happen due to a certain rhyme and reason and you know a equals b how do you go on unless you feel like you can control things so a lot of times this is where people can become very obsessive and very anxious because they're looking for threat in every single thing they see we call that a symptom of anxiety called hypervigilance so sounds of course can be very triggering to people um, i live pretty close to a military uh, base Fort Bragg in North Carolina and there's a lot of veterans around here who are very trigger triggered by the helicopters that we often hear. We have Marines that come into town to do a lot of training and we hear a lot of mortar fire and this can be very very triggering if that is surrounding your previous trauma. Even textures, the way something feels on your skin, you know, people who have been arrested and that was traumatic for them, even watches or bracelets can just remind them of the time. It can also be an internal experience, a headache. If that was the very first thing when you went on to have a stroke, you are going to be triggered by that. Even things like the feeling of stress in your body because your body then remembers, oh, this is very similar to another time I had a lot of stress. That Remember I said before, adrenaline, cortisol, these kind of things. Typically, the most triggering trigger is smell. And this is because all of the senses that come into the brain always go through a part of the cortex before they hit the emotional brain. And when you go through the cortex, the gray matter, you process things and things become a little bit less uh, sensitized by the time they hit your emotional brain. This is true for everything but smell. Smell goes directly to your olfactory bulb and directly to the emotional center of your brain. And don't we know this, right? Smells that are, are gross to us, that are traumatic, are very, very jarring. Smells that are very pleasant to us are very, very soothing. There's something about smell that is very primal. According to the American Psychological Association, and I was mentioning this before, triggers are most distressing to us when they come as a surprise, okay? And again, when you can anticipate something, you can prepare, you can uh, tense your muscles, you can tell yourself a rational story, and it all makes sense. It's when the things are unexpected, do not jive with our sense of what should have happened, the way the world works, this is when we seem to get the most traumatized. So like I said before, what we kind of want to do naturally is to avoid the things that make us feel anxious. The problem is avoidance is one of the most characteristic symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. And in fact, the people who have PTSD, who avoid the most, go on to be the most disabled from this mental health condition, okay? So in many people, there's a trauma and they process it directly. They get back on the horse, so to speak, had a car accident, get back in the car. They have to face the issue. They have to process it. They face their anxiety. They face their fear. They have the panic attack and they keep trying. What really gets us into trouble is when we avoid the thing that makes us anxious, we stop getting in the car, we don't go to the mall anymore, we don't go to the barbecue, right? We don't spend time with friends, we start to live you know, downstairs in the basement. We think on one hand, really uh, it's an illusion, that we're safer because we're not being triggered, we're not having anxiety, but really you're really fueling all of the trauma symptoms underneath the surface. You are suppressing things down so much that yes, it's going outside of your conscious awareness and your thoughts and your feelings, but man, it goes right into the body. And that's a big part of being triggered is that your nervous system is already on high alert. You're already 
uh, hypervigilant, you're already on the lookout. And so things that trigger you, it's almost like confirmation of the world is a scary place. People cannot be trusted, these kind of things. So identifying when you're triggered and addressing what issues it's triggering deep down are a key part of how to work with trauma and triggers. So remember I said I always want to give you action steps that you can take. How do you take this information and really try to um, apply it to your everyday life? That is what is most important to me about this time that we spend together. So what I want you to know is that the most important thing, the first step, is you have to recognize when you are being triggered. And we call this um, the stress response, or I think of it like um, you have to figure out your personal stress signature. So for most of us, there are three things that kick off that fight, flight, or freeze response, okay? And the way I figured out this for myself a few years ago was I did some biofeedback, and it was really, really helpful for me. And what they do is they hook you up to a bunch of different machines, and they're really looking to see which one of these three symptoms kicks off your personal trigger or your stress response. So it's either increased heart rate, sweating or feeling hot, that the temperature in your palms goes up a little bit, or muscle tension. So what the psychologist did with me is she read a little script that was very stressful and they had me all hooked up. And what they helped me understand is that the very first thing that happened to me when I would start to go down the road of anxiety was that my hands would start to sweat and I would get kind of hot. So the idea is if you can nip some of the triggering reaction, some of the anxiety in the bud, that then you can get back to a more clear state of mind to figure out what was the trigger all about and process the trauma more directly. So it might sound like I'm almost encouraging you to avoid this, right? This, the feelings, the anxiety, because sometimes what I tell you is you have to just feel it. The only way through stressful times is right down the middle. You just have to do it and you are strong enough to do it, okay? You made it this far, you can definitely face your anxiety. But this is a little bit different because if you get triggered and you you're then have that big dump of all the stress hormones, you are not thinking straight. Think of how disorganizing it is to feel high levels of anxiety. When you are peaceful and calm, you can think in the future, you can plan, you can you have a good filter, you can hold back, you can make decisions. When you're anxious, don't you agree? You're impulsive, you're quick to act, things fly out of your mouth, you're, you're, you're like, um, very um, kind of agitated. It's not a grounded, calm kind of a feeling and it's no kind of a mental state to think through your emotional issues and why you're being triggered. So the first thing is we have to help you get a little bit back to a grounded state of mind because then you can use some of the healthy coping skills that you're gonna be developing. You can actually put them into place. If you're too triggered and you're too anxious, you really can't do much cognitively. The only thing you can really do is calm yourself down. So this is important because we interpret reality according to our mood. This is a psychological fact. If we are in a good mood, things seem great. The glass seems half full. If we're in a bad mood, man, can you immediately be critical and find fault with everything? This was made apparent to me recently um, when I was looking at houses to buy. And if I saw the house from the outside and I liked it, ooh, everything I saw in that house, I just imagined living there and how everything would just be so great. If I didn't like the house, I was so picky. Everything there, I just thought, oh, that's a problem. I don't like that. I'd want to change that. So it was so such a great uh, experiment for me really because so much of how we process life has to do with our mindset. So if you are in an anxious mood, your perception of perceived threat is going to be much higher and you might see uh, issues, threats to your security where they don't really exist. So the first thing is you have to get out of that frenzied, anxious state of mind, right? The breath is one of the most powerful bridges that we have to go from anxiety to calm. So teaching yourself how to actually properly breathe, diaphragmatic breathing, breathing from the belly, you breathe in for the count of five, hold it for the count of five, breathe out again for the count of five, doing this over and over again, you're basically taking your nervous system, which is wrenched up all the way to here, 
and you're forcing it to go down a couple notches. The next thing is cooling down physically. Remember I told you my stress signature is that I start to get kind of hot. So if I know I'm going into a situation that's going to trigger me, I carry a bottle of cold water. So for me, I personally do not like flying. It's not about the being high that freaks me out, it's the being trapped. That's something for me that is a big trigger and I have to really work with it whenever I have to go flying. So one of the ways I know is that if I can stop that stress response really early by not getting hot, I have found over time that I'm actually able to stay calm throughout the whole flight because it never really gets tipped off, right? The other thing is that we have to learn how to center ourselves and basically um, what you really want to do is try to be mindful, try to be in the moment. Don't think about what's going to happen, right? Something terrible is going to happen. The, the plane's going to, uh, the engine's going to stop working, right? For right now in that moment, there you are and, and you can handle what's happening in that moment. For a lot of people, a visualization of being a big old giant oak tree and standing really strong and imagining, but putting your feet really firmly on the ground and imagining big old roots going out and holding you really, really tight to the earth is very helpful. The other thing you have to do is really focus your mindset. Remember we were saying anxiety is kind of frenzied and it's all over. So focusing on something visual in the room, just one specific thing, Focusing on a specific word in your mind like safe or calm can be very, very reassuring. So once you are calmer and you're not in that kooky state of mind, it's very important to label the feelings that you're having, not the sensations, but the feelings, right? So I'm feeling unsafe. I'm feeling intimidated. I'm feeling angry, right? Those are the feelings that we need to help you identify. Remind yourself, your body is not doing something uh, confusing. Your body is being very smart by sending out this alarm system. It's just that it's a false alarm, right? It's trying to protect you based on its previous life experiences, but it's not uh, accurate. It's, it's, it doesn't need that kind of um, fight, flight, or freeze response in this moment. It's just a trigger. It's just a reminder. It's not the whole trauma coming back. So what we do by identifying the emotions and labeling them and giving them names is we take the power away from the unconscious mind and all the energy that we've put into suppressing these things. We call a spade a spade, right? Um, some of these um, phrases I have found to be very helpful um, in working with people who try to avoid and use that as a primary coping skill is something like what you resist persists, right? The very thing that you're trying to avoid, you don't realize it, but you're actually keeping your anxiety going because you're trying really, really hard to push it down and you're putting so much energy into it that when it pops up, it's going to be forceful. The trigger is going to be intense. So the more you avoid, the more that response is going to be overwhelming when it does happen, okay? So usually we're triggered by issues related to safety and security, okay? So the key from going from dealing in the moment to dealing on a, a bigger scale, a more substantial scale, a deeper scale psychologically, is processing the trauma and finding a safe, supportive person to do that with. A professional in mental health who specializes in trauma is really your best bet. And you know, the details of pe people's individual traumas is important, but the truth is therapy, helps you realize how that trauma affected you. And what we know from trauma therapists is that it really comes down to how the trauma impacted three areas of our life and the way we think. And that is how we think about ourselves, how we think about other people, and how we think about the world. And usually it's so traumatic because a previously held naive belief about the world has been shattered. So just think of how many of us go around believing the golden rule, right? Good things happen to good people. Okay, so what do I do with that belief when I am trying to uh, help a homeless person on the street and um, because maybe there's some major mental illness there um, and the person it has a, a, you know, just got out of jail for some kind of violent issue, turns around and punches me in the face and breaks my jaw, right? How do I make sense of that? I was trying to help, 
right? This is not this person's fault. They have a mental illness that unfortunately made me seem threatening to them and they attacked me. Um, but how is it that I make sense of it? Well, one way people typically respond is, well, why was I uh, walking down the street in, in that part of town? Why did I think I had to stop, right? Wasn't I a good person for trying to do that? And it's very hard to wrap your head around well, why was the outcome that? How is it that this is a rule that I've, I've based my whole life on? Good things happen to good people. I try to be a good person, so therefore good things should happen to me. And this is where thoughts can get very distorted because we really do this weird thing where we somehow blame ourselves because we can then have this illusion of control, right? So the responses that uh, happen as a result of these distortions that we tell ourselves are difficulty trusting people, right? Very black or white responses. So you might go from naively trusting everyone to all of a sudden becoming a hermit and feeling like nobody can be trusted. Believing that the world is an extremely dangerous place, seeing, uh, you know, scissors everywhere you go, thinking that everything is a threat. I talked about this one before, blaming yourself. If only I would have left earlier, why did I try to help that guy? Um, I should have seen that maybe he was a little bit suspicious beforehand, right? So all of those woulda, coulda, shouldas. Thinking about, uh, you know, kind of like uh, some people talk about it, like Monday morning quarterbacking yourself, you know, thinking of all the different things, the better reactions you could have had, um, that if only you would have done something different, then maybe the outcome would be different. Um, People get very critical also in the way that they have responded to the trauma. So if they do become more fearful, people can really be very mean and judgmental to, to, to themselves and feel like they have become weak, that they are inadequate, they are no longer the same person that they were. And one thing we do as psychologists is to try to have people recognize symptoms versus self. Okay, just because you are having a symptom of extreme anxiety and you are now fearful of going down the street, that does not mean that you are a different person and that you are changed and that you are no longer brave and courageous. Okay, it simply means you have a symptom of trauma, of anxiety from a trauma. Okay, so that's a big part of how trauma psychology can help is through education and normalizing normal physiological responses. So like I said before, the more you work on the underlying issues, the less likely you are to be triggered in a given moment. So I hope I've given you some tools to do things kind of in the immediate aftermath of a trigger, but really the truth is to stop being triggered and to stop narrowing down your life and having it get smaller and smaller. You just have to do the work of processing a trauma and really figuring out what is your personal story of the trauma. What is a accurate version of events because all too often I'm telling you it's so cruel the things we do to ourselves the distortions the lies we tell ourselves and then we punish ourselves we hold ourselves accountable so therapy can be great because you get to balance your own thoughts against someone else's you get to think about well what are maybe some more objective explanations for why this traumatic thing happened to me and you, you just really get a lot more into the gray as opposed to feeling like you can control life by Think, seeing things as very black or white. So I hope that that was helpful and um, I certainly know that those tools have really helped me in my life. It is no fun at all to be triggered. Um, it can feel extremely overwhelming and it can make you really want to crawl out of your skin. And so what we really need to do is to have tools with inside ourselves to be able to control our feelings through our thoughts and our behaviors. You know, just because you have a trigger doesn't mean you necessarily have to respond to it and, and let it be in charge, right? You have to remember that you are always the one in the driver's seat and sometimes you just have to go right through the difficult feelings in order to come out on the other side. So I will be here again next week. I do not have a topic as of right now, but I have to say I kind of love these 
psychology ones. I personally um, love therapy and love thinking about the human experience. And um, unfortunately, trauma is all too common. And really, almost anyone that I've worked with has some level of trauma in their history. So I think these things are actually pretty universal. So if you found this to be helpful, I would love for you to share it on your Facebook page or with any groups that you belong to. The more people that understand this stuff, the less people are going to suffer. So thank you guys for joining me, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.